Good morning, Columbia United Church of Christ. It is Tuesday, March 24th, and I am here with uh, today's chancel chat. And today we are going to be looking at the book of Exodus, chapter 2. And I'm going to read that to you right now. You can follow along in your own Bible if you want on Exodus, Exodus chapter 2. It says, Now a man went from the house of Levi, went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the child went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman, Moses' mother, took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and took him, and Pharaoh's daughter took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and he saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked, at the, he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and came to their defense and watered their flock for them. When they returned to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come back so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian has helped us against the shepherds, and he even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he? Why did you leave the man? Invite him to come break bread with us. Moses agreed to stay with the man and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage. She bore a son and he named him Gershom for he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and they cried out, out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered the covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. So today in Chancel Chat, we're taking a look at Exodus 2. After looking at the Psalms last week, we're going to check out Exodus for a few days, and then return to the Psalms on Friday and Saturday of this week. Yesterday, we were introduced to the book of Exodus here in Chancel Chat, and uh, we discussed what this book is about, and we also read Exodus 1. If you missed that Chancel Chat yesterday, you can find it online at the Columbia United Church of Christ website. So the first 10 verses of Exodus 2 are a familiar story to most people with any sort of casual connection to the church. We hear about Moses floating on a basket on the Nile River. There are Sunday school lessons and children's coloring book pages all about this event, and they're all very pastoral and serene. But we have to remember the context here. This was a very violent time. The Pharaoh had ordered genocide 
against the Hebrew people. The very existence of Moses was illegal. His life was counter to the law of the land. We also see in verses 11 through 15 a story that is never told in Sunday school and is rarely even acknowledged in church. Here we have Moses committing murder. Most Sunday school lessons jump from baby Moses in the bulrushes to an adult Moses in his mid-40s or so in the desert, listening to God speaking through a burning bush. What we skip over, however, is what events led Moses to be in the desert that day. The truth is, Moses was hiding from the Pharaoh after killing an Egyptian overseer. Exodus 2 has some distinct features that overshadow the life of the Hebrew nation and have application, I'm sorry, that foreshadow the life of the Hebrew nation and have applications in our day and time as well. Exodus 2 can be divided into at least two sections, verses 1 through 10 and verses 11 through 25. Verses 1 through 10, the story we're most familiar with, are lessons of salvation using women as the salvific figures in, in, in their life. Verse 11 through 15 set up Moses as the embodiment of Israel's future. It's important here for me to mention that much of my exegetical work around Exodus is informed by the book Exodus by Terence Fretheim, and it's part of the interpretation series of uh, biblical commentaries. Dr. Fretheim is a professor of Old Testament at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. So verses 1 through 10 are all about salvation. And they speak of the salvific identity of God most realized in these three women. We see salvation embodied by three women, especially five women, if you count the uh, women who work for Pharaoh's daughter, the, um, the people that work for her. But you see Moses' mother, you see Moses' sister, whom we're going to assume is Miriam, although she's not mentioned, her name isn't mentioned until chapter 15. And we see Pharaoh's daughter. These women saved Moses in a very interesting way. And in those three women, five women, if you count the, uh, for the slave girls that work for the princess, as allusions to God's salvation. So there are some interesting ironies here. For one thing, the Pharaoh's chosen instrument of destruction becomes the instrument for salvation for the nation of Israel. Pharaoh commanded that all male children be thrown into the Nile, and yet the Nile becomes the instrument of salvation for Moses, and through Moses, all of the Hebrew people. Pharaoh does not kill the daughters of Israel, number two. Pharaoh does not kill the daughters of Israel, and it's through those daughters, specifically Moses' mother and sister, that salvation happens. The third point here is that Moses' mother, or the third ironic twist here, is that Moses' mother saves Moses by following Pharaoh's orders. She cast Moses into the river, right? But she did it with a twist. She cast him into the Nile, but afloat in a basket. The fourth ironic twist here is that Pharaoh's daughter defies Pharaoh's orders. She takes Moses in as her own. She doesn't kill him. The fifth ironic twist here is that Moses' mother gets paid from the Pharaoh's own treasury to raise her own son. In this way, Pharaoh's own wealth betrays him. Sixth point here is, uh, sixth ironic twist is that Moses' education, which will later allow him to be a passionate prophet and lead the people of Israel to salvation, comes at the expense of the Pharaoh. Moses is classically educated in Pharaoh's house, and his prophetic ability is informed by that classical education. And the last ironic twist I wanted to point out here is that Pharaoh's daughter gives Moses a name that kind of casts allusions to his future. The name Moses means drawn up out of the water. And then we think about the salvation that Moses will experience with the Hebrew people as they are drawn through the Red Sea. We also see many parallels in these first 10 verses with the parables of God's creation that we see in the book of Genesis. The parable of Noah's Ark, which is a creation parable in itself in Genesis, uh, to illustrate God's salvific power, is closely related to Moses' origins in that the word used for ark 
in Genesis 6 is the same word that is used for the basket that Moses is placed in, in the, on the Red Sea. Just as uh, Noah's Ark is the vehicle for salvation for the whole human race in Genesis 6, so too is Moses' Ark the agent for salvation for the Hebrew nation here. Both Noah and Moses were adrift in watery chaos, but they are divinely chosen ones in whom and through whom God's good creation is saved. There's also a theme of civil disobedience here. The three women who bring God's salvation to a reality are all defying the law. Moses' mother not only hides him for three months, but she also comes up with an alternative plan that literally mocks the ardors of the Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter, after finding Moses, literally flaunts the law by helping this baby in need. And Miriam, Moses' sister, aids and abets their law-breaking actions by introducing the mother to the daughter, to the Pharaoh's daughter, in a subversive scheme that enables Pharaoh's law to be broken. All these women and the two female servants of Pharaoh's daughter are actively engaged in law-breaking, defying the patriarchal misogyny of Pharaoh's womb-stealing agenda. The penalties for such defiance are severe. They all could have been killed. So these first two chapters of Exodus are full of creation theology, and they're also full of salvation theology. This leads us to believe that understanding God's work as creator is a necessary component to understanding God's work as savior. We can't have salvation without understanding the creation aspect of God in our midst. The experiences Moses has in that last section, verses 11 through 25 of Exodus 2, also parallel the experiences of the, Jewish, of the Jewish people, the people of Israel, to that point. From the murder of the Egyptian overseer as a parallel to Cain's murder of Abel, to Moses' exile in the desert paralleling Cain's exile and even Abraham's wilderness journey, to Moses working for a distant relative and taking on that relative's daughter as his wife, paralleling the journeys of Jacob. All of these parables, parallels to the creation parables of Genesis paint a picture of Moses as the embodiment of the Jewish people. The events of Exodus 2 prepare Moses to, for what will happen next in Exodus chapter 3, where God finally speaks to Moses. So think of this story in our time and place. God works miracles through the most unlikely people, women with no power, babies, instruments of destruction, the Nile. God's plan for the future rests squarely on the shoulders of helpless women and a baby. And, and their willingness to participate in civil disobedience. In our time and place, with forced social isolation and coronavirus fears coloring the judgment of ordinarily sensible people, what small miracle is God working in our midst? How is God using the powerless to bring salvation to the world? God is working in this time and in this place, bringing us hope and promise, blessing and salvation. Sometimes we don't realize it because it doesn't come to us in the showy, dramatic ways we think it should and expect. But God's miracles are all around us, and God's salvation is with us always, just not in the places we might expect to look. Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you for your salvation that is with us always. We thank you for your presence that gives us strength. And we thank you for your miracles found in the most unlikely places, even in a baby floating on the sea. Help us, dear God, to have confidence in your provision and your presence and not lose sight of your activity in our world. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tomorrow we'll look at Exodus 3, and um, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow in Chancel Chat. Thank you.